Hello, this is John Paul with Revelations and Grace. In the last article series, we looked at was Jesus misunderstood? And we questioned if his promise to return in his first century generation, if that could have meant a future generation, or if it could have been translated as race, where Jesus would be saying, I'm going to return before this Hebrew or elector evil race expires. We looked at could the Olivet Discourse be divided? Could it have a, a near fulfillment at the destruction of the temple and a far fulfillment in our future? And or could the words have had a dual fulfillment, a fulfillment in that first century that would that was just typological of a final and more literal fulfillment in our future? And and I hope you go back and watch that video if you haven't and see some of the arguments for that, um, at kind of disproving some of those theories. But today I want to go into a more positive case about how the disciples understood Jesus. Because if you think about a historical figure and what he's trying to communicate, one reliable way you can figure out what he meant is by how the people around him understood him. Because they knew the language, they knew the context, they they heard him speak. So if they're telling you what he said, that's that's pretty reliable information. And not only that, but Jesus intended his disciples to understand. He didn't want them to misunderstand. Um, he told them in Luke 8.10 that the, well, in Luke 8.10, he explained the parables to them. And he said, let's find it here. To you, ha it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. So he told them, God has allowed you to understand these mysteries. And before he left, or as he was leaving, he, he told them that he would give them the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth, especially concerning the things that were to come. So Jesus didn't want to be misunderstood. He explicitly gave the Holy Spirit to remind them of the things he taught them and to guide them into all truth concerning the things to come. So the Holy Spirit was guiding the disciples in their understanding of the end times. And if you recall in his promise, when Jesus uses the words, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away. He's communicating in such powerful language because he's not leaving room for ambiguity. He's wanting to be trusted. He's using the utmost certainty because he wants the disciples to understand what he's saying. And so we can actually look at what the disciples understood him to mean. And from that, we can get an idea of what Jesus was actually saying. And over and over and over throughout the scriptures, the disciples repeatedly said that Jesus was coming near. And we're going to kind of skim through a bunch of these articles. I'm basing this off of uh, an article by David A. Green called Preterism 101. And he lists 101 verses in the New Testament where the coming of Jesus was said to occur soon. Um, and, and it's really powerful. It includes that word mellow a lot, which a lot of the concept for concept translations of the Bible won't include that word, but the more literal translations will. Um, and, and that goes back to the fact that concept by concept translations that has to do more with the Bible interpreter's um, viewpoint. They they try to understand what's in the text and communicate it in a language that's more suitable for an English audience. And because futurism is such a pervasive view, some of that bias gets in there. And so they don't always translate that word mellow as about to the way that the Greek should. But if you read the literal Greek words and the more literal translations, they want to kind of copy word for word what the Greek says. And they see that term mellow in there, meaning about to. And they say, well, uh, our methodology is to say what the Greek says, whether we like it or not. So we're going to include it in there. And that's why in most of the literal translations, you'll see that word mellow or about to and all and these end times verses. But but in the concept by concept translations, you won't see them as much. <clears throat> So we're going to be just briefly looking, well, not briefly, but we're going to be skimming through a lot of these verses. Um, and there's some here that David included that I didn't include because they're more related to John the disciple or the uh, um, John the Baptist. When he said, you know, the winnowing fork is in his hand. The axe is already at the root of the trees. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He added other ones like that. But I'm strictly focusing on things that the disciple said after Jesus um, died on the cross. So yeah, we're, we're going to look through this because this makes, and all this is tying together into the point that if this is how the disciples understood Jesus, 
And they had the inspired spirit leading them to understand him this way. And if Jesus was wanting them to understand it this way, then this provides powerful evidence that that's exactly what Jesus promised to do in their generation. So uh, as you can see, we're going to jump into this in Acts 2, verses 15 through 17. This is at Pentecost when the tongues of fire are coming on the disciples and the people are accusing them of being drunk. And Peter says, this isn't um, intoxication as you suppose. What you're seeing is what was predicted through Joel concerning the last days and it shall come to pass in the last days. And, And so, you know, the spirit will be poured out and your sons and daughters will prophesy. And he's saying what you're seeing is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy of what would happen in the end times. And so he's telling them you're in the end times. Acts 17, 31, he is about to judge the world in righteousness. That's that word mellow. Acts 24, 15, there is about to be a resurrection, both of the just and of the unjust. That, that's the second resurrection. That's the resurrection at the end of the millennium. And that was about to happen. Acts 24, 25, there was a judgment which was soon to come. Uh, Romans 4, verses 23 through 24. Um, just as it as righteousness was credited to Abraham through his faith, that was going to be credited to the first century Christians. It was about to be credited when Jesus returned. So there, there's that word about to in Romans 4. And in Romans 8, 13, if you, if you live according to the flesh, you are about to die. That word flesh doesn't always mean uh, sinful nature. It can also mean living through human effort. And that's what the Jews were doing by rejecting their Messiah and continuing the animal sacrifices. They were trying to achieve righteousness through their human effort. And they were about to die. And the reason he says that is because the temple was about to fall and its sacrificial system. And if they were loyal to that system and still in the temple, when that temple fell, they would be destroyed along with it. So even Romans is prophesying about this destruction that's about to happen. Uh, Paul talks about the glory about to be revealed in us. In Romans 9, he says, God is concluding and bringing swiftly his sentence on the earth. Uh, Romans 13, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. Salvation is near now. The day has drawn near. Romans 16, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So Satan was about to be defeated. That's the end of the millennium. Now I say this, brothers, the season is shortened. So it wasn't prolonged, it was shortened. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.31, the present form of this world is passing away. It was about to end. 1 Corinthians 10.11, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Uh, He's saying that the words of the prophets were written as examples for us. They were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages has come. He's saying we are in the ends of the ages. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Uh, And we, you know, the, sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. That's powerful because he's telling them, some of you are going to live to see Jesus. Some of you are going to live to see him return. And then 1 Corinthians 16, Maranatha, it's the last, one of the last verses or the last verse, I can't remember. But Maranatha means the Lord comes. Ephesians 1.21, he says that Christ was reigning not only in their current age, but that he was also going to reign reign in the age about to come again you know the in matthew 24 the disciples asked jesus what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age well here in ephesians he's talking about that same age that age was about to come philippians 4 5 the lord is at hand and this next verse is really cool uh but some people have made the case that The end couldn't have come because Jesus prophesied that the gospel would be preached in the whole world. And because there are still people today who haven't heard the gospel, we can't say that he's returned already. And let's go ahead and look at that. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Well, that that word whole world there... That, we're going to look at it in the Greek. And there will be proclaimed this gospel of the kingdom and all the earth. That word or earth is oikomene. And oikomene, it means inhabited earth, but it more specifically means the Roman world. Uh, because they didn't ac- consider anything outside of the Roman world to be regarded of any account. And that's how they understood it. And that's how the Bible uses that phrase. 
And that's why, like in Luke 2, 1, um, it can say, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire world. Some, some translations literally put the word Roman in there, and other translations just say, in all the world. And if you look at the Greek for Luke 2, 1, uh, and he uses that word world, that's the same world, oikomene. Um, and that, that was talking about the Roman world. So Jesus was actually saying that the gospel would be preached in all the Roman Empire, not necessarily like, you know, North America or China or all those places. Although I do believe it, it even reached China at the time. Um, so that, you know, that, that's what he was saying there. But not only that, Paul actually says that the gospel, he repeatedly says that the gospel had been preached in all the world, that it had spread to the ends of the earth. Uh, if you look at Romans 10, 18, he says, but I, but I ask, have they not heard? He's talking about the Jews. Why haven't they believed? And he's saying, well, did they not hear the gospel? And he says, yes, in fact, they have. For, and he quotes from Psalms, a prophecy concerning his time. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So he's saying they're without excuse because they did hear the gospel because the gospel has spread to all the earth, to all the world. And Romans 16, 26, he says, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. So the gospel, that's what he's talking about there, has been made known to all nations. In Colossians 1, verses 5 through 6, he says, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. He's talking about the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. So the gospel was bearing fruit in the entire world. He's telling them everyone's hearing it. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.17 but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Paul was saying through him, all the Gentiles would hear the gospel and it would be fully proclaimed. So we have evidence, uh, repeated evidence that Paul is saying the gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. And Paul did travel the whole Roman Empire or a vast majority of it and the news spread rapidly um, so that we can say that yes, the the Roman Empire did hear the gospel before Jesus returned. Uh, if we go back to some of the things that the disciples said to indicate Jesus was returning soon, you got Philippians 4, 5, the Lord is at hand. You have uh, Colossians 2, 17, which are a shadow of the things about to be. That's talking about the old covenant ordinances. They were types and shadows of the new covenant realities and the kingdom of heaven, which was about to come into effect. Uh, there was a period of time where the Old Covenant and the New Covenant were in effect at the same time. The New Covenant had started at the cross, and technically the Christians were all under it, but the Old Covenant didn't go out of effect until the temple fell in 70 AD. And during this time, the disciples were righteous according to faith, but they were encouraged to keep the law in order to keep their ministry appealing to the unbelieving Jews, because if they had not been following or keeping the law, the unbelieving Jews would have rejected them and not listened to them. And, and so they had to keep it um, in order to save as many people as possible. But when 70 AD happened and the old covenant fully passed, they were no longer expected to continue, you know, teaching or, or keeping that law. Of course, now we have the law of the spirit written on our hearts. So God teaches us to love and motivates us to love our neighbors as ourself. And, and we have that spirit and that conscience telling us if we're doing that. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the law we live under today. We live through God's love and his love for us and his love for other people. <clears throat> that's part of the new covenant. Uh, and first Thessalonians four fifteen seventeen, and chapter five, verse four, he talks about we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, speaking to the Thessalonians, some of you are going to be alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. And you are not in darkness that this day of his coming should overtake you like a thief. Like it's not going to surprise you. You're prepared and you're going to encounter this day. Uh, later in the same book, he says, may your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, he wanted them to live. Their body was to be preserved until Jesus returned. 
Second uh, Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 7. Uh, Paul is talking to the Thess- Thessalonians who are enduring great persecutions for their faith and being thrown in jail. And he says, be comforted because God is going to repay with affliction those who are afflicting you. He's going to grant relief to you. When? When Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire. And so Jesus was going to come and give justice to the Thessalonians. Um, and, you know, if, if, <laughs> if this is happening, like if you're in prison and Paul comes to you and says, in 2,000 years, Jesus is going to return and give you relief. You're not going to feel comforted by that. You're going to be like, oh, I'm going to die in here. But Paul is telling them, their generation, uh, they are going to experience that relief. Uh, They're going to be rescued because Jesus is going to come and persecute their persecutors. And let's see here. No, I get into that later. 1 Timothy 4.8, devotion, having promise of life now and that about to be. There is a new life coming. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.14, keep this commandment without stain or reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying persevere until he returns. Like, you can make it. There's a finish line coming. Um, 1 Timothy 6.19, laying up for themselves, uh, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time about to come. And uh, I couldn't find a translation that included the word mellow here. So I will show it to you in the Greek if we look at 1 Timothy 6.14, and I'll tell you why I included that verse. 6.14, you'll notice when he talks about, let's find it here, until the appearing, wait, am I reading that right? Sorry, give me one second here. Oh, 6.19. 1 Timothy 6.19. Okay. A foundation good for the future. That word future, that's melon. And that is the same word, to be about to. And I, I couldn't find a good translation that included it, but that is that is a meaning of the word, or it is the meaning of the word. Um, you have Timothy talking about in the last days, there will come evildoers. And he's warning them because it seems like they're seeing the evildoers. Uh, the men who oppose the truth, he's saying, basically, be prepared. He's warning them of these things because they're, in fact, seeing these people who are, are, are deceptive. Second uh, Timothy 4.1, he says, I testify before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and dead at his manifestation and reign. Jesus wasn't just going to judge the living and the dead. He was about to judge the living and the dead. And that word is is in there. It's the Greek term mellow. You can see that in the Greek on Bible Hub. Uh, for Hebrews 1, the, the very opening, the second verse in Hebrews, he says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So the apostles are saying, we're living in the last days. Um, that's that's pretty cool. In Hebrews 1, 14, he says, we're about to inherit salvation. Salvation was about to come. Uh, in Hebrews 2, 5, he says, it wasn't to the angels, it was to men. He subjected the new world that's about to come. And in Hebrews 6, 5, he says the powers of the life about to be, the new kingdom, the new covenant, the powers of that age were about to arrive. In Hebrews 6, verses 7 through 8, he's warning the unbelieving Jews who had rejected the Messiah and were continuing the animal sacrifices. He's telling them that they were in danger because that sacrificial system was under a curse and it was going to be burned away when the temple fell. And if they were loyal to that system, they were going to fall along with it. And that's, that's Hebrews 6 there. Six there. It's near a curse is what he says. Um, Hebrews 8.13, by speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. There was a period where both covenants were in effect. The old covenant was made obsolete. Like for a Christian who had died in Christ, he had died to the law. It was no longer binding on him. Yet they were still encouraged to follow it until it fully passed away. And it would fully pass away when, um, when Jesus returned and the temple fell. I'm going to skip over this one because I'll deal with this passage uh, in the resurrection article. We'll look at that more in depth. Hebrews 9, 26, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages. So when Jesus came, that marked the end of the ages, that his first coming was the end, began the end of the ages. Uh, he says, 
you know, the law, having a shadow of good things about to be. There was something better than the law that was about to come. Hebrews 10, 25, as you see the judgment day drawing near, it doesn't that I inserted that word judgment, but that's what it means when it uses the capital day. He's saying meet together more and more frequently as you see Jesus coming. He's about to come. Uh, Hebrews 10, 27, it's a warning again against the unbelieving Jews. And he says, there's a fury of fire being about to devour the adversaries. The temple is about to fall. Uh, Hebrews 10, 37, for in just a very little while, there's a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. So God promised not to delay and he was going to come in a very little while. Here's a powerful one. Hebrews 13, 14, for here we have, we have no abiding city, but instead seek the one about to come. This is the David Bentley Hart translation. And when he's talking about a coming city, well, what city comes? Cities don't move. They stay stagnant. But in Revelation 21, he talks about a new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. And in the context of Hebrews um, 13, 14, he's also talking about the heavenly city. He's talking about our experience of heaven. And this city, the new Jerusalem, was about to come. It, that, that means the end of Revelation. Revelation 21 was about to take effect. That city was about to come. Um, and let me see if I, yes, you can see it here. Not for we have here an abiding city, but the coming one we are seeking for. Well, that word coming one is melosium. And melosium, again, means to be about to. So there's, there's that evidence there that that new Jerusalem was about to come. Okay, uh, James says, speak and act as those about to be judged by the law of freedom. I believe that's the gospel. And so he's saying, you know, the, those who believe the gospel will be blessed and those who don't believe the gospel will be condemned. Um, and again, he tells the, the rich people who are exploiting and persecuting the Christians, he tells them, weep and wail because you have stored up your treasure in the last days. You've made yourself rich at the expense of others during the last days when all this hardship is about to come. That's not going to go well for you. He tells uh, James 5, in James 5, verses 7 through 8, he says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. You too be patient and strengthen your hearts, because the Lord's coming is near. In 1 Peter 1, 5, he says, uh, God is guarding you through faith for a salvation that even now stands ready for unve unveiling at the end of the age. Salvation was about to be revealed because they were at the end of the age. In 1 Peter 1, 20, it says, God has foreknown you from the foundation, uh, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in this last age for your sake. So he was saying, we're in the last age. And here's a powerful one. First Peter 4, verses 5 through 7. They will give account to him who is ready. So God was ready to do this, to judge the living and the dead. So the, the resurrection, the living and the dead, that, that was ready to happen. And then a few verses down, he says, but the end of all things is near. Well, that word near, that's not the term mellow. That's a different term. It's right here. It, here we are in 1 Peter 4, 7. The end has drawn near. Well, that word near, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, in Gizo. But it expresses extreme closeness, immediate imminence, even a presence because the moment of this coming has happened or is about to happen. The, the idea is this thing is so close, you can basically feel it. It's about to happen. It's one of the strongest Greek terms for something that's about to happen. And scholars don't debate. They don't think it can mean something else. There's not like alternative meanings for that word. That does mean something's about to happen. That's the only definition we have for it. And there's not really a dispute about that. And it's so cool because Peter says the end of all things is near. Well, what end is he talking about? The end of what? Well, just a few verses before, he says God is ready to judge the living and the dead. So it would at least include that. And, and it's not just the righteous, but in those verses, Peter is talking about the wicked who are giving you a hard time. And God's saying he's ready to judge them. So God was going to judge the righteous and the wicked. 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come for the judgment to begin. He's talking about the Neuronic persecution there. Peter was writing kind of right as that was starting. 
and the Christians were facing sufferings throughout the Roman Empire. And this is talking about the Great Tribulation. They're, the Christians were basically suffering for their faith, and it was hard for them to be a Christian. And Peter's comforting them, saying, look, if it's hard, if it's hard to be a Christian now because of all the persecution you're facing, how much worse will it be for the people who reject the gospel and are causing these persecutions on you? So it's going to be even worse for them. And he encourages them to hold on, to resist the devil, and, uh, and he will flee from you, and to be comforted that their other brothers throughout the empire are facing the same sufferings. And that maybe that he's referring there to how the devil had inspired Rome to persecute the Christians and, and blame the fire on the Christians. And so they were to resist um, that persecution and stand up for their faith. And let's see, 1 Peter 5.1, he says, The glory which is soon to be revealed. So there was a glory coming. It was about to be revealed. Uh, Peter, 2 Peter 1.19, We also have the word of the prophets as confirmed beyond doubt. So this prophecy is not in doubt. It is surely going to happen, and you should pay attention to it. Uh, because as, as a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So the day was about to dawn. They they should pay attention to it because it was coming. Uh, Second Peter 2, 3. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. He's talking about the false prophets they were seeing. They're about to be condemned. Second Peter 3, verses 3 and 5. In the last days, scoffers will come, but they deliberately overlook the fact. He's talking about scoffers that they're seeing in their time. And he's saying this is proof that we're in the last days. And if you read through this passage, I'm going to deal with 2 Peter 3 in a future video. Uh, I talk about that with in my article, What Now? on Revelations and Grace. So you can read my explanation there. Essentially, he's talking about the destruction of the temple here. And some of these words have been mistranslated from the Greek. But when he talks about the day of the Lord coming, he tells them to anticipate and hasten the coming of the day of God. Like they're, they're expecting it, they're to expect it and they're to hasten it. Like they're not going to slow it down. They're going to hasten. Well, how do they do that? They do that um, by being godly people and enduring the persecutions they're enduring and through their prayers. And the reason that's going to hasten it is because God had said in Luke 18, he told a, a parable about the persistent widow. There was a judge who didn't want to give this widow justice and she kept persisting until he finally gave in and gave them justice. And God tells them, I'm not like that unjust judge. I will give my, I will give my people justice quickly. Uh, it would be unjust for me to delay in protecting them from, and delivering them from their persecutors. And he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And the idea is, the way God was going to give justice is by having Jesus return and rescue the saints. The same thing he said in Thessalonians, that Paul said, that you know Jesus is going to return on the clouds of of heaven with his mighty angels of flaming fire and he's going to rescue you from your prison from your persecutors this is the same lesson he's teaching in the persistent widow you know it's it would be unjust of him to delay and that's the same thing being said here that peter's telling the christians when you're suffering and god sees you suffering that that motivates him to come even quicker than he was anticipating so yeah it wasn't going to be slowed down it was going to be sped up First uh, John two eight for the darkness is fading and the true light is already shining, so that's an idea that the the light of the new covenant, the light of the gospel, the light of the kingdom of heaven, is already shining. You're already seeing the sun come up over the horizon. Uh, it's it's nearly daytime. And the okay, and then in John two seventeen he says, and the world is passing away in its desire. But the one doing the will of God abides the age. Like if you're following God's will, you're actually going to see the new age come. First John 2, 18. He, this is powerful. Children, it is the last hour. He doesn't just say it's, it's the last days. He doesn't say it's the last days. He says it's the last hour. And just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. This is how we know it is the last hour. Well, where did they hear that the Antichrist was coming? Jesus told them in Matthew 24, verses 23 through 34. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. 
For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So John is recalling the words of Jesus, and he's saying, you're seeing this happen. You're seeing those false prophets and those false Christs. And because you're seeing it, you can be confident that you're living in the last hour. These are the last days. He says that again in chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. And this is, in fact, the Antichrist, which you heard that is coming and now is already in the world. So the Antichrist was already there in John's day. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 7 talks about the mystery of lawlessness. He says it's already at work. We are told that there was going to come a lawless one in the last days. Paul was saying it was already at work. It was already there. And he was currently being restrained. Someone was restraining him to prevent him from fully carrying out his work. But whoever the lawless one was, he was alive in John's day or in Paul's day in, in this book. Uh, Jude and the book of Jude, he's condemning certain men who have creeped in among the Christians unnoticed. And he says they were prophesied long ago to be condemned when Jesus returned. He even quotes from Enoch, a prophecy um, like thousands of years before, where it talks about the Lord coming with his myriad of holy ones to execute judgment on everyone and convict the ungodly. And he's, he's applying this prophecy to the men who have creeped in among the Christians uh, and their assemblies. And that verse is even confirmed further down in verse 16 through 19. These men, the men who have creeped in among you, uh, they're, they're evil people. And remember, and he says, but you remember what was foretold by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ when they said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who follow after their own ungodly desires. These are the ones who cause divisions. So he's saying the scoffers that you were warned of, it's these men who have creeped into your assemblies unnoticed. So, so be, war be warned against them. Uh, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon come to pass. That word soon or quickly there, uh, that's the same word that the angel uses when he wakes up Peter from a cell. Peter is handcuffed or chained and he's in a cell and the angel comes and says, get up quickly. And he uh, helps him to, he uh, releases his handcuffs and he says, you know, uh, let's, let's get out of here quickly. And that's the same word that's used at the beginning of Revelation. Uh, just two verses later, the time is near. Those two phrases complement each other. It's something that's quickly to happen, and it's something that is near to happening. What else could that mean? Revelation 2.25, nevertheless, hold fast what you have until I come. Like, continue to persevere until I come. You're, you're going to make it to that day. The finish line is nearly here. Uh, Revelation 3.10, I will also keep you out of the hour of trial being about to come on the whole inhabited world. That's also oikumene, you know, talking about the Roman Empire. To try those dwelling upon the earth, there was about to be an empire-wide persecution of Christians. And God was going to spare some of the Christians from that persecution if they obeyed. Revelation 3.11, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may take your crown. Revelation 12.5, and she brought forth a male son who is about to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. And I'll skip over this first because we'll deal with this in a future video. But God was basically saying uh, the great city Babylon is going to be judged. And in her was found, was she was guilty of the blood of all the prophets and saints and all who had been slain on the earth. And Jesus said that the Pharisees in the first century who rejected him, that they were going to be counted as guilty of all the blood of the prophets and saints who had been killed from the beginning of time. So the Babylon here in Revelation is referring to the unbelieving Israel who rejected their Messiah and, and crucified their Messiah. That was the great, great city of Babylon. And we'll get into that in a future video. Uh, Jerusalem, the prostitute. That's, a, that's an article I have in my blog where you can see this if you don't want to wait for the video. <laughs> Revelation 22, 6. This is the last chapter in Revelation. He says, these words are faithful and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Uh, I believe that's the same word. Oh, well, no, that's further down. Uh, Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Revelation 22, 10. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. 
like unveil all the details, reveal the mystery, tell everyone about it because you're about to experience all the words in this book. And compare this to Daniel 8.26. In Daniel 8.26, he tells Daniel, don't reveal all of the details of this prophecy. Don't reveal all of its secrets because it concerns the distant future. This concerns 490 years in the future. Um, and, and so he tells John, like, you're not going to know all the mysteries here because it's not for you. It doesn't apply to your time. But he tells John in Revelation, do understand all the mysteries here because it is applying to your time. That's another strong indication that they expected him soon. Revelation 22, 12, behold, I am coming soon. And verse 20, he who solemnly de declares all this says, yes, I am coming quickly. That's that same word that the angel used to break Peter out of prison. So yes, the disciples repeatedly over and over and over said that Jesus was coming soon. And someone might look at that and say, well, soon doesn't really mean soon. It means thousands of years because in God's sight, a day is as a thousand years. And, and so, uh, you know, that, that's what soon means. Well, if the apostles are using soon that way, if they're using that, would they have acted in the belief that they were about to experience Jesus's return? If did all these words mean, oh, it's going to happen anytime in the future now or hundreds of years from now? Well, look at their actions. They, they didn't get drunk because they didn't want to be caught off guard by Christ's arrival. Uh, they, they wouldn't get drunk because they needed to be prepared to flee Jerusalem. They would meet together more and more frequently as they saw the day approaching. It would affect how often they went to their local assemblies um, because they saw that the day was coming near. Peter prepared, commanded the Christians to be prepared for swift action. Paul uh, encouraged the Thessalonians that they would be relieved of their persecutions when Jesus returned. That's, that's an awful thing to say if Jesus wasn't going to return for thousands of years, or if that's what he believed. Um, 1 Corinthians 7 verses 26 through 31 actually make an even more powerful point. You can see that the Christians lived different lives because they expected the end to come. Paul says it was better not to get married because of the present crisis, because of the persecutions they were facing, and because everything was going to get really distressing. And it would be easier for you not to have to flee with a spouse who might be persecuted for your beliefs. Um, and he says not to invest in the world. Don't go to college. Don't, don't get entangled in all the things of this world because it's passing away. And in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, because of the present crisis, I think it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not live for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. He's talking about the end times. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Because the end times were going to be so distressing, he's like, don't, don't invest in the world. Don't get too attached to the things you have because they're going to be taken away and you're going to need to, to flee. And in fact, it's easier. It's going to be easier for you if you don't marry. So uh, let's see, where was I? Okay. Uh, James, James 5, 9. This is interesting, but some scholars take this to mean, I'm going to open up the passage here. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And some scholars take this to mean that James was encouraging the Christians not to start lawsuits against their rich oppressors, the people who were oppressing them and uh, exploiting them, because they would be thrown in jail and it wouldn't go well for them. Whereas if they just waited a short amount of time, Jesus himself would return and give them the justice that they wanted. So he's like, you know, hold off on a... Uh, Hold off on starting those lawsuits because Jesus is about to come and personally give you justice. Oh yeah, and this, this verse, 2 Peter 3, 4, and verses 8 through 9, the, the verse that people say, okay, this is proof that, that Jesus is saying that his return is delayed. Well, um, when it says, as their generation was about, okay, when Peter says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, I'll get into that in a minute. Sorry, I need to collect my thoughts here. 
Yeah, uh, what was happening is these, these false prophets were coming in and they were saying, well, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the foundation of the world. And the Christians were starting to get concerned and they were thinking, you know, uh, Jesus promised to return in our generation and now that generation is almost over and he hasn't returned. And so Peter comforts them, even though God has waited towards the end of this generation to act, he did it so that as many people as possible would be saved. But he also says earlier in the letter, the prophecy is sure to happen and God is not slow uh, as some consider slowness. So he's not going to delay his prophecy. He's still going to come on time. He's just waited until the very end of the time frame to act. And, and notice this, if, if the false prophets and if the Christians said he could come anytime, our generation, a future generation and hundreds of years, we don't know. Why would they have been concerned about a delay? Why would they, they have been worried that it, he seems to, their generation was about to pass and he hadn't returned yet? You know, that's evidence that they were expecting. They interpreted Jesus to mean he was coming in their generation. And when Jesus says, or when Peter says that the day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, he's not saying that the Lord literally sees a thousand years of, of our time as one day in his time. It's not an equivalency. What it's saying is that when God makes a promise, even if it was a thousand years ago, he remembers it as if he made it today. He doesn't forget or neglect his promises. He's always going to fulfill what he said he would do, even if that's thousands of years after he promised it. So this is, this is really powerful because Peter's saying, you can be sure that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. He's not going to forget. He hasn't forgotten the promise to return in his generation. He's going to fulfill it. Um, and he's not going to be slow about it. And you should be patient and hasten his coming with, with your obedience through suffering and through perseverance and your prayers. So yes, the disciples didn't just say that Jesus was going to return soon. They acted in the belief that he was about to return. So if the disciples repeatedly throughout the New Testament meant that, if they meant he was about to return soon, and these are inspired apostles writing the gospel under the inspiration of the Spirit, then that's how we're to understand what Jesus meant. That's how we're to understand the promise to return in his generation. Jesus was going to return soon. He said that, the apostles reinforced it, and nearly every, there's not really a contradiction, every scripture in the Bible enforces that idea. So I think we're on very solid grounds to say the end times were about to happen. And uh, hopefully in a future video, we're going to go into how it did happen. We're going to look at some historical quotes that indicate that Jesus was, was on the clouds in 66 AD and that angelic armies were seen and flaming chariots. So I, I'm excited to share that with you and thank you for watching. And uh, I appreciate your time today and I hope you have a good day.